It's so great to see you guys. Thank you for being here. Uh, we want to start by going to the ABC 27 newsroom 20 years ago. Keith, you were the assistant news director. Alicia, you were anchoring the 6 and 11. Yes. Dennis, anchoring live at 5. Valerie, you were weekend anchor and a reporter at that time. Yeah. And George, you were the assignment desk right. editor. So first, let's start by reflecting 20 years ago. Can you believe it's been 20 years? I, I feel like I can't believe it's been 20 years. And the reason is the feelings that were so intense on that day are still very much with me. That, that first feeling of, wow, you know, well, something bad has happened. And then, whoa, something, something much bigger is going on. Um, you don't lose that kind of a feeling. It, total shock. And it's been 20 years, but 20 years from now, we'll still remember it because for our generation, it was, it was Pearl Harbor. I think, I think some moments it seems like yesterday and some moments it seems far ago, but no matter what, it is a moment that changed our lives forever and the course of the country, and our children will live with those consequences. Well, my, my kids were just becoming teenagers, and, and now they're in their 30s, and, and this was, uh, the 9-11 was their first big never forget moment. I remember thinking it's the 20th anniversary, and like our group said, it doesn't seem like it's been 20 years, but then when you get closer to that day, you realize it feels like it was just yesterday. Talk to us about how that information first came in. I believe you two were together. We had a morning meeting every day, and we would go over the content for the day, and remember vividly that it was a, you know, a normal day, and all of a sudden something came across on the ABC squawk box, which we would hear ABC could talk to us and say, hey, here's something that's coming up. And in those days, there was no social media. There was no, not all the, the YouTubes of the world, et cetera. So there were monitors of live feeds and they said something's gone on at the, the World Trade Center. And we saw that video be punched up and there was smoke coming out. We yeah. thought it was a fire. The, the night before, the Monday night before, there was a, a bad accident at the York Fair. A youngster was killed in a roller coaster accident. So we had a crew down there first thing Tuesday morning. And uh, they called in about the time this is all happening and, and uh, said, we, we've got to change your plans. And they said, well, what do you mean? They, they didn't know what was going on. I said, we've got a, a big story going on. And I, they, they said, well, what, what could be bigger than the story we've just been doing? And we went back and forth, and it got rather, rather raw, rather, rather difficult, because we were defending what we wanted to do. And we were watching when we saw the second plane hit the second tower. And I still remember to this day, the staff, everyone started to gather around in the newsroom. And you're watching these monitors, and we're listening to the special report audio. And, you know, we work in news, and sometimes you have to be tough. You're, you always feel for people, but you, you see some things that not everybody wants to see. And, you know, I saw tears uh, coming down the faces of some of the young people that were watching the monitors at the time. We really started to have the co complete understanding that this was really big. But I remember there's a number of us, and you're having a fight over what story you're going to be doing. Yeah. But the, the significance to me was, no matter what we did, we weren't getting on the air that day. We were not on the air that day at all. It was in New York. And I don't think that's happened since, where they just took, took it. And it hadn't happened prior in my career. Uh, so that's, that's how big that was. And you can imagine. Uh, I mean, I understand how that crew that day thought, what could be bigger than a child dying at yeah. the York Fair? There can't be anything bigger. Why would you take me off this story? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it took us all a while to understand how big this was. And then that feeling, we're being attacked right. at home. I remember sitting in my house doing my hair. I was getting ready to go to work. And my husband was ironing, and I was watching TV. And I saw the first plane when they finally started to replay it go in, and I thought, hmm, that's unusual. And then they were saying it was a small plane, and I'm like, that did not look like a small plane. And then I saw the second one enter the building, and I knew immediately that we were under attack. That can't be a mistake. And I remember thinking to myself, first fear, you know, because you're like, what's next? 
and I, we still have to come in and do our jobs. You know? and, and I remember leaving my house that day, you know, kissing my husband goodbye, and then thinking, am I going to see my house again? I know that sounds really far-fetched, but when something of that magnitude happens, you have no idea what the rest of your day is going to unfold. So true, that feeling of vulnerability that we, we had been uh, so lucky to have never felt before. You know, it made me think of how many other countries, how many citizens in other countries, they've lived with war on their land. We, we, never, we never dealt with that. You always felt like when you were in America, those things didn't happen here. You didn't have, you know, the people walking around with semi-automatic weapons in an airport and so forth. And wow, did that change. And I mean, now when we look down the road, heck, Harrisburg International Airport wouldn't exist in the, in the form that it's in. Harrisburg International Airport, first airport built after 9-11 with the specs that were required of the new safety specs where they screen it under the bags that go under. Yeah. First one built after 9-11 and with uh, safety measures in place. But I think that day as things started to unravel and we see the Pentagon and we see Shanksville ultimately, you know, we locally George and I would be very much involved in that morning meeting, and we started, well, where, crew, where, where do crews have to go? Yeah. TMI was an obvious place where we needed to see if we could connect there. This area is rooted in a military tradition with New Cumberland, uh, you know, you've got uh, Letter Letter Kenny, Kenny, et cetera. Uh, well, and Mechanicsburg. Depot, Mechanicsburg. Yeah. So you've got all of that here, and so you, know, you, you realize, well, well you, we could be a target. Well, you know what's next? And there was a little bit like like TMI too back uh, back in uh, in '79 where the there came a, a heavy dose of viewer phone calls in that. Uh, this was sort of before emails, so a lot of phone calls. People shocked. What's going on? You know, they're feeling weird. They're feeling upset, and and that was uh, had a, had a lot like TMI. And this theaters so, weren't the only ones feeling that yeah. way, right? Because all the planes landed, and it was silent in the skies, and then three fighter jets appeared over Three Mile Island, George, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah, that was... The government was worried, too. Yeah. The governor of Ridge at the time, uh, they knew there was a plane on the loose in western Pennsylvania, didn't have much information. They evacuated the state capitol, knowing that it appears that big symbolic seats of government were under attack. Now, we now know that was probably likely headed for Washington, uh, but they uh, evacuated the Capitol out of an abundance of caution. Said we should leave just to play it safe. Do you think that's a good idea? I'm just going by what was said. There was a lot of nervous people, uh, staff, and rightfully so, uh, great concern as to what, what is happening, and uh, that was the right thing to do. I picked up a phone call that night, just happened to and a woman said, I was there. And I said, come on down. And, and we interviewed her right in the parking lot. And she was at the World Trade Center for a meeting. She was about to walk in, a plane hits. She stood there stunned. And it wasn't long before she said it, it was almost like raining. Of course, things were coming out the windows. Keith said it where you have to harden yourself a little bit to the things that you hear and see, and you, you can't take everything in. But this was one of just three stories where I, I, I started to tremble a little bit during this interview. It, it was so um, graphic, and she was a mess, of course. And we just hugged at the end of the interview. And I, and I remember that interview, and I remember a similar reaction as a gentleman called, showed up, said show up at the front door we went out and you know the guy was literally white and mm. covered with this dust you know he had been right there at ground zero the, you know the emotion that he had gone through and sharing that with our audience but it was it was so uncertain those times that morning i was speaking at the uh, navy base in mechanicsburg and it was for a breakfast meeting and i went on the base with no problem like you normally do like the place was it's just a suburban little uh, base Guy at the gate says, hey, how you doing, Gwen? And then the events unfold. My event gets canceled. I watch the events with the commanding officer of, the, of NAVSUP, as a support activity. And as I was coming off the base, there's now five guys out front with very large weapons. And they were in no mood to talk. And they were uh, whooshing everybody away from the base. And it dawned on me they, they didn't know if they were a target or not. Yeah, that day I was at Station 1 Firehouse. I saw 6th Street. We were set there together. 
the we is Mike Kurleski and I. I was a photojournalist at the time. And I remember we were watching the firefighters who were watching what was going on and just really felt for them to know that there was nothing they could do. You know, their brothers and sisters and arms are in there and, and they, could kn they know they're dying because they see these buildings coming down and they know what they do for a living. They know they rush in. And it was just so hard to watch not only what was unfolding around our country, but also to watch those firefighters. And it was just so emotional for them. I remember telling my kids, remember this moment, because it's not, uh, when's the last time there was a world with no airplanes up in the, up in the sky? And what I thought was really phenomenal was how we came together as a country and how flags were sold out. You couldn't get one to put in your front of your house or, and how people were just so compassionate to each other. You know, we were in this together, we were fighting this together. While it was a very tragic incident, they brought out the best in people. Let's talk about Governor Tom Ridge. Dennis, I want to start with you. Um, so he became, he, he w was governor here, but then was called up to the national level. So talk about that. What was it like having our own governor um, not only, you know, be helping in the response here, but then being called up? Well, of course, Tom Ridge was on the short list for George W. Bush to be vice president. And so the two knew each other and had a relationship and I think were very fond of each other. And then after September 11th, uh, President Bush started thinking to himself, I want to reimagine national security. I want to reimagine the way we're dealing with terror in the 21st century. And thought Tom Ridge would be the perfect guy to, to lead that. So uh, Tom Ridge was speaking in Washington on something else in a couple of weeks after 9-11. Uh, after uh, and he was whisked to the White House. And then things started happening very quickly, and like in a day's time. Uh, all of a sudden, Tom Ridge was tapped to head this agency, and Tom Ridge, who was in the military, uh, basically saw it as his nation's call, and he was going to answer the call and, and go do it. And then just in the course of uh, really a day, day and a half, he said, I'm, I'm going to take this job, and then turned it over to Mark Schweiker. Mark Schweiker, the only governor to become governor as a direct result uh, of 9-11, and Tom Ridge went to Washington and ultimately came up with the, ultimately was the Secretary of Homeland Security, merged some 22 agencies into one. Pennsylvanians were so proud of Tom yeah. Ridge, I think, that he went and took this major new job. That was, that was sort of a bright spot, if there could be one. I think it was more comforting to us because we knew him. So knowing that and knowing that he's been elevated yeah. made me feel just a wee bit safer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually just went back and listened to the speech, the farewell speech he gave uh, to the joint session of the, of the state legislature. And I was, I was struck, I, I had forgotten, he was a very good speaker mm -hmm. and a very convincing person. But he, uh, his aide told me a story that, you know, when he was going to give that speech, he took a, took a card out and put it on the podium and then put it back and, uh, at the end. And uh, the aide went to him and said, what, what was on that card? What was on that note card that you put down on the podium? And he pulled it out and he showed it to me and he had written, be strong, the bastards are watching. So as a result of September 11th, a lot of people were called then uh, to sign up for the military. There was a strong, you know, belief. People felt, as you said, everybody felt united. And we covered a lot of, you know, departures, returns. Uh, can you share some of those stories? What was that like? Yeah, so um, the departures, tough. Um, I'm a military brat, so I was raised by a military family. So I know what that kind of feels like. And to see the kids and to see, you know, the moms or the dads left behind, you knew it was going to be a tough go for them. But the returns, they never get old, even to this day. The returns are spectacular to see the families reunited and some coming home finding out they've had, you know, new children. Mm -hmm. Wives were pregnant when they left and they came home to, to find a new son or daughter. But you can't thank our military enough. I mean, they go, they volunteer, they go in harm's way to protect our freedoms. And not only them, but the intelligence community that serves us, your firefighters, your police officers, your first responders, we depend on them. And we owe them a great, great debt of gratitude. Those stories, there's, there's never bad video. There's great interviews, there is emotion, there's the best of every news story in those, uh, in those stories, because you've got kids flag waving, proud parents, grandparents. I remember just the stories of where we'd go to an elementary school and they'd surprise mm -hmm, yes. a child in yeah. school, oh, yeah. you know, and it just would tug at your heart and that their, their mom or their dad would be back, for example. It was, it was just amazing. And, and, and two, I think, you know, there's, there's not a lot of bright spot out of 9-11, but 
the, the country coming together in many ways that we don't see today. Um, the patriotism, uh, just also uh, the, the genuine appreciation. You know, I always knew that firefighters did great things and uh, rescue personnel did great things and police did great things in, in tragic situations like this, but boy, uh, you know, you really have this depth of appreciation for the service uh, of going in into harm's way and uh, always representing the best of us. We, we did learn, I mean, firefighters, military, it is, it is a different breed. You know, as you, you watch the video of the people pouring out of the towers, those who could get out, and the firefighters passing them going in. Uh, it's, uh, it's where would we be without these people? The other video I love that we get is when they surprise their moms. Oh. It just brings such a huge smile to my face. And the mothers inevitably just scream. You know? <laughs> I just love those videos. And I do think to touch on what Val's talking about, I, I mean, the, what I like about the, the send off and the come home, you, you realize these people did volunteer. In World War II, the greatest generation, many of them, there was a draft at that point. So people were going. These are people who don't have to putting their hand on the Bible and saying, yes, I'll go do it. And I think there was a, an increased fervor after 9-11. And it's just great to see it. And it's all walks of life and, and all races and colors. And uh, it's just, it's just uh, some of the best of America. Share your story that we aired not long ago about the young lady. Yeah, Sabrina Thomas was from Chambersburg. And uh, she had three months left before she was getting out when 9-11 happened. So they came to her and said, we'd like you to go, to go to Afghanistan. But we understand if you don't want to, your tour is up. But if you do, you're going to have to sign up for an additional year. And she said, I'll do it. What she didn't say is she was engaged to be married to her Green Beret husband, and had, or fiance, and hadn't discussed it with him. But sure enough, she said, he'll understand. And of course, he did. I caught up with her 20 years later, recently. And she has two daughters married to the Green Beret husband. They live in Washington State. Uh, but she, she said when she was over there, uh, it was very apparent the sexist nature of the culture over there. The women walked two steps behind the men. In fact, some elders didn't like her presence at times, even spit on her. Uh, but she said what she took great pride in is that she noticed that many of the young girls in Afghanistan watched with great curiosity, eyes wide, that there's a woman with a weapon working with men that that is even possible. She was very proud of that and was sure to share that story with her daughters. Well, 20 years later, we have to talk about it. The Taliban's now back in Afghanistan. The timing, I mean, I, it's caused a lot of anger. Um, a, a, there's a lot of, you know, mixed feelings about that. So knowing what happened 20 years ago and now looking at Afghanistan now. Well, I think there's, some, there's great sorrow for many of the people that were there that here we are on the 20th anniversary and the people that were there and were helping the attacks that happen are back in power. But as a couple of military people said to me as well, we can't be there forever. That was their view too. I mean, it's been 20 years. How long is that supposed to go on? That's, that's a view as well. One thing I, f I, I just feel confident about is that my guess is, I mean, we are going to have a presence in the Middle East for a long time. It's not going to be, you know, thousands of our members of the military. I'm probably a, a glass half full sort of guy. And we're all news junkies and always will be. If you cut us open, we kind of bleed news. And, you know, I think about all the things we've seen. And I, w I would, I feel in my heart strongly that I would want them to know as a, a military fo folks that have actually been boots on the ground that what they did is not in vain. I was to, to Shanksville a couple of years ago for the first time and I haven't been to every memorial in this country but that's certainly one, one special place there because you go in there it's pastoral it's very quiet you're outside people are talking in low whispers and and, and, and then you go in the visitor center and you, you, you almost get your skin peeled back listening to what's going on with the, the people on the plane. But I think as long as we have something like that, I, I think we'll be, we'll be prepared for anything there because that's so different. And that, that's just a reminder of what can happen at a moment's notice in the middle of nowhere, where, which is where Shanksville is. 
Mark Schweiker, who became governor, and, and uh, first response is one of his big things. Uh, his concern, he, he has a very real concern, because remember, when 9-11 happens, all of a sudden the first responders have to react. Now that we're af out of Afghanistan, he said, those first responders better be on top of their game. He's concerned that because we're not there the way we were, as George W. Bush said a few times, unfortunately, maybe they'd come back and, and try to hit again. I agree with you about that. Think of how many things, I mean, our military being there over these decades, I, I'm just convinced they pr we prevent a lot of bad things from happening. Yeah. We talked about how things changed after 9-11. Uh, you talked about the airport and things like that. It's my son's 20, so he doesn't know. There's other people out there that, first of all, they didn't see those images. Um, and secondly, they don't understand how it changed day-to-day -day lives. And I had a wedding in January after, and we, had, we were going to fly. And I said, I think I'm going to take my chances on the train. And that was a long, we weren't going to Atlanta. Um, but I remember being very apprehensive about being in the air. And actually, at that time, it was probably the safest place to be because they were so on top of security. But that still lingered for me. We never had the, the terms like, if you, if you see something, say mm -hmm. something, uh, for example. We, we never crossed those kinds of bridges when we were pre-9-11, I don't think. And I think now it's kind of a common part of our everyday language and thought. And I think we're all prepared. If I'm on a flight, I'm defending my country. Mm -hmm. I think we're all the same. We're, we'll, you know, do what we have to do to keep others safe. It's so true. You know, when something happens on a plane now, uh, and, and there have been some times where the flight attendants, the pilot would have to say, you know, we need some help. People get up. They, they are ready to defend their plane. It's so true. For, for me, the, the biggest thing that has changed is just sort of, and I talked about this before, it's just the mental shift. It's a gear shift of, you know, it's easy for Americans to be sort of like, we have it so good that uh, you could just feel, you can be oblivious. And, but I, I mean, I definitely don't feel that way anymore. You would never think before maybe going to a concert that you could be attacked. Um, so, I mean, even like concerts going there, they were, security is tighter. So I don't think people know that that, that didn't exist before <laughs> when you went to those things. I think it's also uh, somewhat softened 20 years later, but in those days after 9-11 and four months and perhaps even a couple of years, there was fear of the unknown, mm -hmm. like when's the next attack coming? What, what's going to happen? I remember going up to New York City not long after to do a story. And we had some time, so we were going to tour the Empire State Building and seeing the military in front with heavy weapons and weaponry. And I was like, mm. you know, at first I had a little apprehension going up, and then I thought, well, they're here to keep you safe. You know, so I think it took a while for Americans to actually go back to doing their normal things. Anywhere you go that's big, you go through a metal detector. You know, whether it's a concert or whatever else it is, it's just every, everything changed. Felicia and Dennis, remember how we didn't smile for a long time <laughs> yes. during our newscast? That was really tough. And our new, it's, it's a point, I mean, our newscast changed dramatically. Dennis, you used to be yeah, on Live at Five every Live day. Live at Five. That was, was such a fun show. It was. Where did the fun go? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I think the he, mood of the viewers it, changed. And, and we responded yeah. to that. It was a fun, lively show that was different. And we did that. And we did it for a number of years, and we were very successful at it. But then. You know, overnight, the appetite changed, at least temporarily. I think it was tough just watching for like days on end the coverage. And I don't know how many of you did, but I would go home and cry. It was just so emotionally draining, you know, not only to have to finally start reporting on it, and when we finally got back in the air, when network turned it back over to us, but I remember just going home and it was just relief just to let it out. Because it was 24-7. You know, we do this for a living. We're reporting on it. But then when you go home, every single station had it on. Talking yeah. about the good, though, one thing I'll never forget is we would do in the, in the days and weeks following various drives on television. And you do things all the time on television. You get somewhat of a response. But the response was overwhelming in the days after 9-11 when we would do various shows trying to raise money for causes related to 9-11. People would, we had cars lining up 
to come through and give us uh, to make donations and it, and it was just an amazing time because I think the average viewer the average person just wanted to do something to help it was a beautiful time in that way it, it, it was we were all in it together misstaters are so generous let's talk about the, there were a lot of hard images things that stick with you forever looking back what is the image or the moment that sticks with you the most I think two things the 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 magnitude of those buildings coming down, people running covered in dust, and at the same time emergency personnel running right towards them to help them and to try to get more people before the next building went down. And I, I just, that, that sticks in my mind. For me, you know, sometimes still photos are even more powerful than video. And the image that sticks in my mind is the image of a man his floor was on fire. He chose to jump out the window. And his body was turning. And uh, um, yeah, that, that is the image I'll never forget. It may have been on the cover of Time Magazine. I'm not sure. That was horrendous. I'm a proud Irish person and love bagpipes. But amazing grace, bagpipes still gets me choked up after all of those firefighter funerals, in, mostly in New York City. Uh, it's, I still get emotional thinking about that. Another picture that, um, that seared in my mind was all the first responders. I looked back at all the old pictures we had, and to see my friends that I knew that were there at the time, um, one, John Gilkey with his uh, canine bear, they were sleeping and huddled up, and they were still covered like in dust, um, and just seeing the faces just the sad faces of the firefighters and the first responders, knowing that they tried their best and their friends and their loved ones were still in that building. Can't, can't watch, I, I just refuse to watch that anymore. I just can't, I can, I can watch old newsreels of Pearl Harbor, doesn't bother me. Uh, JFK, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, doesn't bother me. But I refuse to watch that because that just, it just is, is too, too much, too much. If there's one thing, like a takeaway, how it's changed life the most for us here in the Mid-State, or you personally, what would it be? Um, for me, I think uh, really a foundational respect for emergency personnel in our military that I think before I appreciated, but I appreciate to an even greater level what they do to protect our freedoms. And then the other thing is that each day is a gift and you'd never know what that day's gonna bring and to cherish the relationships and the people that you love around you. I don't know why this is what I want my answer to be, but I just feel like I want us to remember that we all need each other. Um, you know, we go through traumas, every generation has major traumas, and we need to, you know, embrace each other and be there for each other, and to me that's what life is all, all about. And, I don't know, somehow that's what I take away from it. I want to piggyback on her, because that's, you're right, but uh, we're in as partisan a time as I can ever remember right now. And I am buoyed by thinking back to the great spirit of camaraderie, and we were willing to help each other. And we didn't ask, are you a Republican or a Democrat? Did you vote for this guy or that guy? None of that mattered. And I wish we could get back to that feeling. It's there. It exists because people that live through it know it exists. But we've gotten far more than 20 years away from good feelings, unfortunately. Yeah, I think it's never forgetting, as the slogan is, we should never forget. You know, history does repeat itself. And we have to make sure that still, while it's still painful to remember that time, we have to learn from that time. And I agree with Dennis and Alicia, just people coming together you know, we were so strong then. We were a family, a really tight-knit United States family. And it would be nice to see that brought back again. But definitely treasure the loved ones that you have, because each day is not granted, or you know, each, each day is not always going to be given. You know, each second is not going to be given. So cherish what you have. Be thankful. Be grateful. And so grateful for our military and our intelligence community and all of our first responders, thank you, thank you, thank you.